Okay. Willkommen auf, uh, aus No Like Trust By. Um, thank you very much. Today is Trust. Uh, as I was just saying, this again is a massive experiment. So, welcome. It, the whole thing is a how to guide, generally, or as I was just discussing with Steve, it seems to be more of a why guide, which needs to be turned into more of a how to guide. Anyway, so, thank you for coming, and um, not going to see Neil Diamond. Good work. <laughs> there's also there's some kind of business awards on tonight, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. I'm nominated for an award, but I'm not going. <laughs> I, I don't care about such things. I'm with you, punk rock, for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good work. So, um, that's why Latif's not here. Latif is here for. He's not punk rock. No, he's not punk rock at all. But Northern Lights are up for two awards, both of which I should not have to do. Anyway, so thank you for coming. Um, my name, obviously, is Neil. No, obviously not. My name is, is Neil Simpson. Um, for those of you, I need this gentleman here, who um, don't know me. One of the things the boys from uh, Venice Fire last week mentioned was that it'd be really nice. Hey, below. It'd be really nice to know who's in the room. Yes. Just to know who's talking and from from what kind of point of view. So. Um, what I thought this week might be quite handy to do is a little bit of a who am I and what do I do? So if we start at this end, and if you could just kind of a couple of words about what your name is, what your business is, and a sentence on what to do. Thank you. My name is Ed Payne, I have a company called Third Phase, and I deliver selection and engagement work with small firms, and my target audience is law firms, because they're in <laughs> Great, perfect. That's about the right length. I need to shake a bit. Okay. Jonathan Williams, um, I work as a work based coach. Um, I work with adults with neuro differences, um, which is things like dyslexia, dyspraxia, um, especially sometimes people that have had strokes, um, who sort of you know, want to carry on working and contributing and everything. And, uh, I really enjoy it. Thank you. I'm uh, Philippa Hawks. I'm an author and publishing professional, and I teach authors how to become better authors, basically. She found out today. <laughs> <laughs> In <laughs> every sense. Good work. Hello, my name's Bilal. Um, I've got a couple of businesses. I've got one in the pharmaceutical industry where I offer consultancy services. I've got another one in health and wellness, and I've got one I'm just saying up with Stephen and, and another guy, uh, um, <coughs> Joseph, um, which is a digital media uh, marketing agency. I'm Chris Johnson. I'm a writer, author, um, under the name of CJ Harter, and that's kind of what I do. Um, but I'm also um, selling other local office books at the minute on a sort of little market stall type of there, at community events, and did to be makers market on Sunday. If anybody wants to come to that. Right. Uh, Ian Moore. Um, Sort of involved in IT in all sorts of ways, but um, here really got this website called Venues for Hire, 20,000 venues. Want to find ways to get more people to come and look at it. That's why I'm here. Hey James, I do what he says. Uh, <laughs> you have that, you have witnesses now. Yeah, we, you know. we, we, we work <laughs> together. Like um, but I'll also <laughs> sell you some specialist more whiskers if you want that. Mm. And I'm just starting to set up a little business importing very strange things from China. Okay, legal strength. Oh, yes. Okay, good work. I'm Bex, I'm a business with my sister Lynn, and we make sustainable badges for businesses. Sustainable? Badges. Not badges. Not badges. We've been here already. We've got another business as well, and Lou, and we also design and sell wooden jewellery made from upcycled wood, which will get thrown away or burn and whatever. You get it before it's burned, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I feel I've got a, an IT support company in education. Um, we're branching out into business managed service, and as Neil said, we don't know our ass from our elbow. <laughs> um, so that's what we're here to start the journey. <laughs> I'll do it quite, put it quite like that. Yeah. Um, so something like that. <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sorry. Yeah, I'm Julian, I'm a management consultant and I help consultants uh, sell more, get more clients and get better fees. Good work, Ooh. fantastic stuff. 
Hey, uh, I'm Stephen. Um, we uh, I build websites, um, motion graphic animation. Just help people. Um, just help people communicate better with their with their audience. And obviously, doing work with Bill Howe as well. I'm Sarah from Picard Design. Uh, it's my own design business. I do commercial interiors and outside spaces. So currently working with some schools on forest school projects and all sorts of really wonderful things, but space design. Yeah. In my home country, Brazil, uh, we make furniture using old food, old woods from old farms and to old uh, manor houses. Here I am develop a business plan uh, towards business to business is to use uh, byproducts and scraps of materials uh, for manufacturing. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. It always stuns me that you kind of that you come here for a because if I was trying to listen to somebody speak like me in Portuguese, there's no way I'd manage it. But that kind of speed and complexity. So um, someone asking if I wanted a ticket to see the other. Fuck off. It was actually. Is he impressed and still Good work. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Neil Simpson or Diamond, which one do you want? Yeah, yeah. just the better Neil, that's all I can say. Yeah. Um, was it Neil Diamond? He, Sorry? Was it Neil Diamond? He just had the wrong ticket there. Yeah. Steve, mate, Steve. Here yeah, we go. It's Neil Diamond. You can't see the show. Um, yeah, Julie, what you, what you might not, it, it's, it's quite casual today. It's not like a big, it's very much a facilitated conversation. My, Neil Simpson, obviously, I work in brand and swearing. Uh, generally, um, I help people tell better stories about their business so that they find the right clients. Basically. Um, so, no, like, trust by it, it's a tiny little bit of a recap. It's a, it's a process. I've heard for years people go, oh, We only do business with people we know, like, and trust. What they don't understand is that it's a process. So, it, the process involves three key principles. One, doing business on purpose. The, the key, one of the things that a lot of businesses do is that they do business by accident. They just kind of meander along. Mentioning your names. Meander along. <laughs> doing. <laughs> hey, what you said last week, you did very well. Come he on. did, amazing. Uh, amazing. That's how, that's how the difference of doing it on purpose. Yeah? Just asking for what you want, getting, getting, more, getting more people involved. So, again, many points of reflection during these kind of workshops is that, okay. What am I doing on purpose in my own business? What am I not doing on purpose in my own business? And then fixing that. Um, one of my other key principles is that all marketing is conversation. Key thing about conversation is that's two way. That listening is twice as important. Uh, <laughs> should I have a little cliche alert flag? That listening is twice as important as talking because, as they say, we have two ears and one mouth. <laughs> so, um, yeah, <laughs> cliche alert. So, uh, yeah, all marketing is conversation, so what can we do to create that conversation and facilitate it? You know, like we were saying in papers, that how can you then start a conversation about how can you be a better author? Mm -hmm. It's not just a question. I work with a lot of musicians and they have the same shit attitude. I'm a genius, fucking respect that. And it's mm -hmm. just like, well, yeah, but how much are you respecting that? Yeah. Yeah? So rather than just waiting for somebody to come along, give you a giant non recoupable advance, and then go, oh, well, there you go, love. It doesn't work. Those days are gone. So and it's that conversation about helping people understand what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And the third one is that all business is a relationship. <coughs> and again, like any, any relationship, the quality is in its two wayness. Uh, I won't get you to imagine that I'm, I'm, I'm your boyfriend again. But you get the drift. That it's, it's about giving and taking. So this is the, this is the model that, um, we, that No Like Trust Buys working to, is, is that there's kind of four stages that um, you've got everybody who doesn't know about you at one end, and you've got a single buyer at the other end. And the purpose of marketing is to take people from this stage through this stage through these other ones. Now, the thing about no is, is what, what is it? What impact can you make? Like is about liking how you do it. Trust, which is what we're going to focus on today, is about why you do it. Trusting that you can deliver, and trusting why you can do it, because. In these in this world of uh, this world of production, why why you do it is really important. It's like Vix and Lou have a reason why they do it. Why why do 
wooden badges that are renewable and upcycled. There's a reason why. And once people get that reason why, they can choose whether to get that or not. There's a reason why Dave does his coaching the way he's doing it. Um, it's, and once you understand why, and it's never for money. If you talk, if you talk about I'm just doing it for cash, it's never going to work because nobody wants to feel like they're just a wallet. So um, that's just. And then this is uh, next week is going to be about buy, about how to create a compelling offer. Um, <coughs> I'm already starting to panic a little bit about next week, actually. But <laughs> I'll save that for later. Because the making, the making of the offer is like, it's the, key, it is, it's the key thing about understanding what people actually want to buy and how you help them understand that. Um, I've got a whole thing about narrative of, narrative of internal dialogue, but we'll talk about that next week. It's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. So, um, recap on the first week. The, oh, there are videos becoming available, by the way. It's just taken me for bloody ever to do to process them. So, um, to recap, first week was about no, about creating a compelling brand based on your values and how you create a branded experience. Understanding your ideal customer, which is about um, creating a persona from demographics, and then leveraging your, pers your persona's dreams and goals. Um, and the third bit about that was creating an offer that people wanted to buy. It's about um, we're going to retouch on this one in the, in the next week's thing, but uh, customer value proposition, and then the 90% what, 10% how. And then like, last week, seems like forever ago already, man. Absolutely forever ago. It's about the myths of business, five myths of business relationships, about you know how you have to be professional and, and how the purpose is strategic, but it's not, the purpose is communicative. Um, about how, what you need to do to yourself in order to be likable, and then what you need to do to others in order to be likable, and then the two golden rules of patience and trust, and that everything takes a little bit longer. So, um, <coughs> this is what we're going to be looking at today. I'm just going to check my video camera to see if it's rolling. Uh, yes, it is. About, I'm going to start off. This is had a little bit of a thunderbolt, as usual, when I was talking about this. about. And I've asked a question, a self question that I've not really considered about before about why trust exists. Anybody considered this before? No, exactly. So, trust is a biological imperative. We're going to talk a little bit about that, about why, and about the functions of trust. What the functions of trust are, and about. And I've isolated a formula for those maths nerds among you. There is an actual formula for trust. I'm going to teach you it. It is bullshit maths. I'll tell you this now, it is absolute bullshit math, but it does work. So we'll talk about the formula, how to use it, and then we're going to finish with um, the four key principles of trust, which are what people are, what people see, what people feel, and what people want. And people write them, and always makes me feel dead valued when people do that. I couldn't care if you're just all big, drawn on a big cock on your paper, but it's just blood. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Um, does that all sound all right? Any questions? Fantastic. So, trust. Joe Owen, who is a management consultant type person, he's, he writes a lot on influence, and he's had a rather large influence on the way I think about these kind of things. In his books are good. His, his books are really good. He, his book, Influence, is brilliant. In fact, um, massively underrated. And um, his thinking is where most of the formula, the trust formula came from. I don't think he, he, he kind of gave me the kernel of it. I took a little bit further, because that's just the kind of guy I am. Um, but his thinking is great, because trust is the currency of influence, which is a massively elegant way of saying that, because unless people, if you want to influence somebody then first, or at some point you have, they have to trust you. Um, just as an aside, one of the things he suggests in his book is that um, trust is much easier to, to obtain if it's for a limited amount of time. Yeah. If, if I was to say to you, can you all just trust me for the next three minutes? You're much more likely to do that rather than, can you just decide to trust me, please, for the rest of time? Because even though it's me, how wrong could things go in three minutes? You know, you're not... 
you're not actually putting that much on the line trusting them for three minutes. So when you want people to trust you, if you can make it time bound, it's much, much, much uh, more effective. So trust, and this is the kind of this is the kind of core thinking behind the whole of the trust module. It's about gaining influence. Marketing is about creating action. Stat, because if it doesn't create action, then you're not marketing anything. You are informing people, and it's. So, um, first question, why does trust exist? Any clues? Anyone want to take a stab at it? <clears throat> Necessary to survive? Yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm going to take you on a little journey. Um, so, sorry, for, um, I'm going to disabuse you of some uh, thinking, uh, but we're not descended from apes. Sorry for those people who didn't know that. And also, God didn't make us in seven days. Sauce. Okay. What we are descended from... Six, though. Oh. Oh, yeah. yeah, six, in oh, fact, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Just how often I read the Bible, doesn't it? So, um, these chaps, Australopithecus, right? This is um, largely agreed as our um, furthest back common ancestor for most of humanity. Very interesting bunch of people. First lot to walk upright... Um, just to give you a little bit of a timeline, this blue bit here, last 2,000 years, it was when um, Jesus hung about, 2,000 years. This green bit here is the entirety of Homo sapiens, 200,000 BC. <coughs> then all the way back to here, to Homo erectus, is 2 million BC. Um, this is where farming started, at about at about 50,000 BC. Did you create this? Huh? Did you create this? Did I create what? Yeah. Wow, awesome. Okay. <laughs> Just a slideshow. <laughs> 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 Rocky science. Okay. So this is this is where farming this is where farming kind of happened. And uh, before all of this was hunter gathering. Okay. Hunter gathering. So this is where fire happened. Just uh, about 1.4 million BC. And, tool, uh, and tools, i.e. using a stick to... Oh, right, using a stick happened at about 1.8 million BC. Okay? Now, Australopithecus happens at 4 million BC. Okay? And that's when trust starts. Okay? So, as you can see, trust is biological imperative. Julian was bang on. Julian was bang on about it. It's, it's oh. essential, essential for survival in, in these kind of terms. Because the, the, the great thing about Australopithecus was that they were they worked as a team. Okay? Now the, the key thing about working with a team is the notion of how can I how much can I depend on you? Because if I'm gonna if, if I'm if I'm this chap here, obviously much better looking and significantly better home. Um, this chap, if I'm this chap here, and I need to go, to go for a kip of the night time, I need to know that the rest of you bastards are going to be awake, or somebody's going to be awake, so that I don't get snatched by a saber-toothed tiger, etc. And this is where we get the notion of tribe. Who can I depend on? Who's got my back? Yeah? Because what, what this allows us to do is to work as, work rather than what, as one individual person, as a team, and teams are fantastic because of two things. One, they can bring significantly more force to bear on any given situation. And we can, then we can have specialism. Right? Now, specialism, is when, specialism is when humans did this. That's when um, we stopped using two of them. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the, the key notion is that we're all in this together. And this is going to be something I touch on time and time and time again today. So we're all in this together. There's a notion of that we all survive or we all fall together. Has anybody watched the Bear Grylls thing? Mm. The island? I watched yeah. one episode. Okay. Yeah. But it was all about trust and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. When they get it, when they, when they all get there, because we live in such a kind of coddled and ridiculous environment, they're all like, well, I don't want to do that. I just want to sit on my own and do some sunbathing. And then they all fucking start off. Because that's what happens in a situation where you have very little force to bear on your situation. On your surroundings. But unless this happens, everybody suffers. Okay? Robert Cialdini in his book, his marketing book, yeah, great stuff, amazing. You know, based on science, it's not just his thinking. And if you if you're gonna read one book on marketing, that's the one to read. 
What's your second name? Cialdini. C-I-A-L-D-I-N-I. -I. He has a number of laws of, of, of marketing based on influence. And number five is reciprocity. And it is astonishing. He, he cites this study <coughs> where um, he's got, he talks about two researchers going into a room and they're doing some kind of meaningless tasks about stuffing envelopes. And there's, in there, there's a research subject and uh, one of his little kind of research intern monkeys. And the intern monkey go, like, they, they both think they're both students. So the intern monkey goes, oh, I'm just going to go for a drink. and goes and get one. Comes back and he goes, I've got one for you. Gives him a, gives him a kind of a, a bottle of Coke. Both have it. And then later on, they sell, he, he tries to sell them some raffle tickets for a show. Now, in the two, two test studies, in, in the study group where they are given something first, they regularly buy five times worth of tickets than they would um, if they're not given something. So if much less likely to buy something when they do buy something, they buy five times more. Just if they're given this coke. Yeah? Amazing stuff. So reciprocity, because, because when people give us things, we feel like they like us. We're much more likely to feel like we're part of their tribe. Which is why, when we were talking on the first week about our ideal customer, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on, then how can you, how can you make them feel part of your tribe? So, reciprocity is a key thing. And this, this is why trust is important. You learn to trust somebody by the quality of relationship that you have with them and how much they invest in you. How much do you, well, the question is, how much do you invest in your tribe? A, do you know who they are? B, do you know what they care about? C, what do you do for them? Because the thing is, I get so hacked off with businesses who the only time I ever hear from them is when they've got a fucking sale. And they think that them selling me something of 80% of the regular price is them doing me a favour somehow. Could you go through that again, please? Who are they? Um, I can't remember. Who are they? What do they care about? And what do you do for them? Here we go on video. Let's hope it's the same both times, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, reciprocity, really key thing. And this is a point of leverage in your own marketing. One of the, the other thing that um, being part of a tribe does is, is about specialism. Um, I've chosen two tools. One, hand axe, and the other one is a, about a, a, a mouse. Okay, and they are both both they are both the signature tools of our age. Okay, so they're both about palm sized, and they're both how we use how they're both what we use to succeed in our in our surroundings. Homo erectus and Australopithecus. Well, Homo erectus had this. Um, we have this. Okay. Now the thing is, this is where specialism happens. One guy made all of this. Right? One guy will have found the flint. One guy will have napped the flint. And if you wanted an axe, you'd just go, oh, I'll just go make myself an axe. Spend three or four hours. Make myself, um, make myself a lovely hand axe. I can go off, I can hunt, I can cut, I can do all kinds of stuff with it. Now, the thing about specialism is, it's enormously more efficient. Nobody knows how to make these. Nobody. Nobody knows even how to make a pencil. Because when you think about all of the different phases of production in a pencil, okay, finding the graphite, mining the graphite, producing the graphite, milling the graphite, putting the graphite inside the pencil, then you've got the wood, you've got the paint on the pen, you've got blah, 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 blah. These are all specialist jobs. We don't need to know how to make the rest of them because all we need to know is who does know, need to know. And this is where specialism creates an amazing amount of abundance because the one person who does know how to make the plastic for this or how to make how to do the design work for this or because if you think about it to design this you need something like AutoCAD right AutoCAD itself needs thousands of people to make it which depends on thousands of people who've written the code which depends on thousands of people who've made computers which depends this is what specialism does and you can't do that on your own because he can't know everything. So when, I, when I'm trying to order a mouse, when I'm a project manager at Apple or 
wherever. And um, so just launch the train anyway. Um, if when I'm a project manager at Apple, what I need to know is who who's going to deliver on time, on budget, and that kind of thing. Who who can do it? Who do I trust to deliver? Does this make sense? Yeah. So this is why trust is absolutely important because it it, it facilitates acceleration of technical genius. So think about all the stuff you can do with this. And think about all the stuff you can do with this. This, the, the, you can do everything from Star Wars to heal children to send a man to the moon, do anything with this. It's part of the link in the chain, but with this, very little. And this is, this is the difference. So, Australopithecus, by learning to have this kind of trust function, by learning to be able to depend on each other, not only not only just for protecting themselves, but to help each other thrive. Yeah? And if you ever get the chance, Simon Sinek, if you don't, if, you, if you're on TED, Simon Sinek, who writer of Star Wars, why? He talks about this a lot, and he's much better than me. Um, he talks about selective roles. You know, there's a reason why um, the biggest and strongest people in history got the most food because when the enemies came over the hill they were the first ones pushed towards the bad guy only oh, had all the fucking food off you pop go and protect this now right it's not the same now sadly okay this is, and this is where specialization starts big dude more food go and protect us yeah so trust is a function of time okay a bit like religion is a function of time, in the fact that religion is there. You appease God, God does a favour for you in the, beginning, in, in the future. Pray well, be nice, live contrite life, the harvest will come in. Yeah? It's the same with trust. Trust is a function of time. It's like, okay, trusting people now is, is, is one thing, but when you invest in something, when people, invest, when people pay you, when people pay you to do some stuff, it's a function of time. Can you deliver? Yes. So how can you show them that you can deliver? Such proof, generally. Because the answer is not how can you deliver, but how have other people benefited by what you... How have other people like me benefited from you delivering to them? This is what social proof is. We talked a little bit last time about... Um, why there are no scientists on shampoo adverts anymore. Because people don't trust scientists anymore. People trust people who are just like them. Which is why you've got dudes in the shower going, oh, it's so fantastic, I smell amazing, I'm off to get laid. Yeah? And because that's, that's a more believable than a, a man, obviously, because that's glasses, white coat, um, telling people what's good for them. And trust is the same function of time. This will happen in the future. Give me some money, I'll swap you some services. So, let's talk about risk later. Um, <coughs> trust is also a function of core values. Okay, value alignment. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about David Cameron today. Oh, great. Because he's a cunt and I hate him. Sorry, he's a horrible man and I hate him. Are you right? Uh, yeah. Okay. No, there's just some genteel people in the room. Okay. Any Tory for fans here? Matt, Matt? I don't care. I was hoping Sam would be here. So beat on him. Sam is a Tory. Do you know what? You could tell he's a Tory. Yeah, I know. But I, love, I love Sam. But trust is a function of core values, right? Do we both want the same thing? Yeah? Because it's much easier to trust people who want the same thing as you do, who are working towards the same thing you are, than it is to trust somebody you radically sees the world in a different way. So, trust is a function of why you are doing what you do. And the more clearly you can do this, the more clearly you can show people why you do this, it, it, it facilitates more trust. I'm trying to save the world one business at a time. I'm, I'm making no bones, <laughs> it's not even a joke. I'm trying to, because I believe my values are that you guys know all the answers. This is why I'm not here kind of reading like a textbook. I'm trying to spark something in you that's like, oh fuck, I get it now. 
and then what you can do is you can use those principles to direct action because actions change principles don't. So the trust formula. Totally bullshit maths, beautiful, isn't it? It looks like it's really official. Okay. CT times T, uh, CR over risk time distance multiplied by CA plus CO. Anybody impressed here? Pretty good. It was pretty official, wasn't it? So, I'll de uh, uh, demystify this. I'm going to talk to you talk to these uh, bit by bit. So, the core trust formula is connection multiplied by your credibility. Yeah? Because the more credible you are in improving connection over risk times distance. And then that value is multiplied by your care and your consistency of message. And that's basically what trust is. Does anybody struggle with that? What do you mean by distance? I'm going to come on to this. Okay. Um, but basically it's not geographical distance, it's not like proximity, mm -hmm. it's about value alignment, yeah, and about integrity. So, uh, like, say we'll touch on in, in, uh, in a minute. So, first thing we're going to look at today is connection. There's a reason why you guys are all here, um, because you all love me a little bit. So, <laughs> you do, you all love me a little bit. Um, we had a twin army. <laughs> With the exception, the exception of Julian, is that you've all seen me speak somewhere before, and you've all gone, oh, "I like that." Not sure why, it's but I like. <laughs> there's, there's more to me than just a haircut. You know? So, um, and it's about connection. At some point, we resonated. You know the. You know about the principle of musical sympathy. Okay, no musicians in the room. Good. Um, if if I have a uh, if I have a room full of stringed instruments and they're all tuned to the same, if I pluck the E string on a cello, all of the E strings are ring in the room because it's musical sympathy. They're all vibrating in the same thing, and this is where connection really? is. Yeah, really. Excuse me. Check out musical sympathy. Musical sympathy. <coughs> okay. So. YouTube, yeah. The, the, key, the key thing about your audience is, is, is the, the note is to start off with a connection. Are you one of them? Okay? Like we were talking about last week, about the, the International Geordie Alliance. It's a thing, man. It really is. Um, not, not, are you not, I'm not suggesting you all become kind of the Stats Geordies or anything. <laughs> Although, if you have a fancy try the accent, it's a shot of you, it be hilarious. <laughs> Um, but think about your customers, your key. Think about your ideal customer from week one. Okay? Are you one of them? Because one of the things I've kind of realized over the last couple of weeks is that if, you if you've designed your ideal customer, I'd be, what I've noticed is that when most people talk to, to me about their ideal customer, they are very similar to their ideal customer. When you were describing your ideal customer, you kind of fit in that demographic. And imagine you fit in the demographic of most of the people you work with. No. No? no. Educated? 35 plus? Well, you, know, okay. yeah. you know what I mean? Certainly in terms of what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah? So yeah. what I'm suggesting is that generally we are very similar to our own core audience. Author. Wants to work with authors. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So the thing is, is that are you one of them? <coughs> And how do you show it? This is the key thing. Is my, I quote my granny a lot of these things. And one of the things she used to say, if I'm not in the actor, this is a bit of not one, but um, it's okay doing good, but you have to be seen to be doing good. Yeah? Because if you're off doing good in, in your own kind of dark and private thing, then nobody else understands and nobody else knows. So sharing your good news stories, that's really critical. That's what we're doing that with marketing. Exactly. You so just do it like in the workplace as well, don't you? Yeah. You know, you need to show people what you're doing. Everything. 
heavy, heavy. You That's what my tagline is right now, which is why I've got my team doing like tag me whatever you do. Yeah. You do something good. Yeah. So it means I get include, busy marketing. Include everybody. Include because this is what your customers need to know. And this is what you guys need to your content strategy needs to be around is people people who use venues and sharing that stuff. So where like you, we use venues, this is how we kind of share the good news about this, this is case studies and you know success stories and that kind of thing, and people go, ah, I want to do that. Yeah. So, how do you show it? Um, as we mentioned kind of a, a few times about listening, okay, when you think about your core customers, when you think about your ideal client, how do you listen to them? Because talking is only half a message. Uh, yeah, referring back to my massive rant in the first week about just getting the message out there. You can, if you're just getting the message out there, then you're not listening to what comes back. Right? If you're too busy shouting, you're not kind of seeing who's responding. So the key thing is, as I said at the beginning, two ears, one mouth. Oh man, I feel dirty just saying. <laughs> so, how, I do, not in a good way. How can how can you build in the listening to the message? It's like if you if you've ever <coughs> kind of worked in retail, retailers spend a lot of time giving out kind of discount codes and that kind of thing, so they can check who's taking advantage of the sale. Yeah, and usually they'll try and make you they'll try and make you buy the discount for giving you even more info for you giving them even more information. So how can you build in listening to what do they want? Because the thing is, if, if, if I send you an email in the future, all of you guys an email and go, how are things? And you're like, oh, Neil, yeah, thank, you thank you so much for turning and changed my life. Right? Which, of course, it has. Um, and then I go, yes, but what do you, what, what's the challenge that you're facing now? And you, you all answer a particular answer. What do you think my next email to you guys is going to be? If it's like, oh, well, I've, all that stuff's really great, Neil. But I can't work out how to fit it in the day. Rather eerily, you guys will get an email from me a week or two later on going, I have a training course in how to invest time better and to get more what you want. And you'll be like, bloody hell, how does he know that? That's fantastic. <coughs> it's not rocket science. But and if you listen to what your customers are saying, if you listen to what your potential customers are saying, then they will tell you what they want, and it will seem like you're reading their mind. Okay? Not only will they tell you what they want, but they'll also show you what language they want it reflected back into. Because if they go, oh, I, I need to work out how to make it all work in the time I've got, my strap, like my headline for the next, that email is, how to make your work work in the time you have. Yeah? And it's like, yeah? So, this all begins with listening about what help do they want and uh, what, what do they want, what help do they need because sometimes they're two different things. Um, the key thing is, this is where the ideal customer comes in. Have you ever tried to listen to more than one person at once? It's impossible. Okay? This is, multitasking is bullshit. Sorry. It's a bit like slicing a plum. Right? Where you can see, it. multitasking is Slicing your attention very, 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 very thin. But it, it's not like slicing a potato, which is nice and kind of crisp and clean. It's a bit like slicing a plum. You lose a little bit of juice and stuff in the middle. So multitasking is absolute nonsense. Best listen to one person at one time doing the one thing. And then you can focus on them, and they feel like you're listening. Have you ever been on the phone with somebody, and you can tell they're doing something else? Of course, you, nobody in the room has done this, right? <laughs> nobody in the room has done this at all. But you can tell, and you're like, you're talking to them, and like, yeah, uh, yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, sorry, what was that? Because uh, you can, you can feel, you can feel. Does that make you love them, or does that make you want to stab them? <laughs> Very nice and jolly, aren't you? Yeah, massive and jolly. It, it, it makes you quite stabby. Yeah, it definitely makes me quite stabby. Because it's like, if you don't want to talk to me, just put the fucking phone down. I've got better stuff to do than try and maintain your attention. This is why Facebook's better, because you've got the chat there. <laughs> yeah. But to be saying? fair, I'm just saying, now when, you, when you're busy, but obviously, best thing's actually... Phil, what's better? Telephone or email? Telephone. Yeah. 
telephone. Thank you very much. Face to face, he does. <laughs> <laughs> that simple. It's 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 fine if you're not saying anything of any. You know, you're just chatting, which is great for Facebook. But if you want people to do shit, get them on the phone. Talk about marketing, then yeah. <laughs> get them on the phone, and you can only talk to one person once because they feel significant. More significant, so. so <clears throat> and this is again ideal customer. What we're talking about in week one. Because the important thing is decide who you want to talk to. Right? Decide who you want to talk to, and then build everything into so that they can talk to you very, very clearly, and then listen to what they have to say. Because that's where the money is. And if if you want to sit down and talk to somebody. But if you sit down and talk to somebody, then they value that and they build trust like that. Now, your ideal customer, um, six key points uh, of information, demographics, psychographics, buying habits, information sources, that kind of thing. Um, if you think about the stuff I gave out in the first week, there's a little kind of worksheet that I did with that that you can help kind of, that you can help can help you design your. Uh, your ideal customer. So I would use that as a starting point, and then work out how they want to talk, how they want, you know, how they talk, how they listen, that kind of thing, and then just understand their moment of need. Okay, because that's really important. Understand the moment of need, because if you're not there, I'll, I'll send you the, I'll send you the, the, I'll send you the paper, Pete. Yeah. Because um, th this is really key. This is where all of you, all of you talking is uh, good for. So. Um, the next stage in the trust formula is credibility. About how to build credibility. Um, credibility is a funny thing. It's literally, does your talk match your walk? It's that simple. Uh, it is. It's, it's, a, it's about this. Um, and that's your brand. Yeah, because your brand mainly is how, 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 where does, where does what you say cross, cross what you do? Um, avoid softeners, okay? I'm trying to get a photo of the, the really cool graphic. With that? that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like a copy. Are you, is, can I have a copy of that or what, how are we doing that? That's awesome. I think it's really, really good. Uh, yeah, I'll have a copy of it if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Just put it on your Facebook, we'll copy and paste and share it. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's, that, it's, it's, it is that simple. Um, <coughs> core of your brand. The brand is, do you walk your talk? And we can, like, if we think about all the way back in the first week, authenticity is really key. Yeah, authenticity is absolutely 100% key, and I'm going to show you why right now. So, um, can I just give you another image for that car too? Yeah. There's a second one. If you, if you just talk at your customer, you won't notice they walk. So. <laughs> but I like that. Yeah, it could work. Uh, so avoid softeners. Okay, this is something I punch students for. I was going to say gently, but not really. Uh, I will try. When I get business plans with, I ho we hope that this will happen. Hope has no place in a fucking business plan. Zero place. Either you're doing something to make it happen, or you're not. See, when anybody says, I hope, fuck off. Don't waste my time. Yeah? It seems I'll do my best. Boy. <coughs> Just do it. As Yoda says, there is no try, there is merely do and not do. So, um, avoid, oh, uh, yeah, so avoid softness. Think about all how you deliver your information, how you talk to your customers. I've tried to do it that day. I'll try and deliver it on that time. Well, well, I'll do my best. Admission of defeat before you start. Or, my fucking favourite hated one, this idiot. Right? <laughs> Dave Cameron, not extraordinaire, during, the, during, his, uh, during his election kind of thing, trotted out this bullshit, I don't want to. Right? I don't want to get rid of working tax credits. What did he do this week? Abolished fucking working tax credits. Right? Because he's not saying, I'm not going to. He's saying, I don't want him. He gives him a massive back. Oh, I don't want him, but I had to, SARS. But it worked. You voted for him. You got in. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Somebody did. Somebody. Yes, the South. Yes, the South. Because the thing is, the, the guy is an oily, ham-faced idiot. 
So, I don't want to get rid of working tax credits. I don't want to make cuts to frontline services. Did he? Of course he did. It, basically, I don't want to tell the truth. Right? I'm like the millionaire lefties. Pardon? I'm like the millionaire lefties. It's not, a question of, it's not a question of left or right anymore. It's a question of people versus corporations. Right? That simple. Do you know what he's doing today? Uh, please don't. No, no, do you know what he's doing today? He's got all his friends joining the Labour Party to elect this idiot on the left. Ah, right. Make them yeah. totally unelectable forevermore. Corbyn. Don't like Corbyn. He yeah. just found out yeah. today he went to my school. Yeah. yeah. Corbyn. Yeah. Lovely there are thousands of Tories joining the Labour Party. Anyway, he's talking about being a football race school. Is yeah. he yeah. best friends with Luke at Murdoch? Yes. There you go then. The future, the future of politics <laughs> isn't about left versus right. Left and right is done. Right? Absolutely done. The future of politics is about people, the rights of people versus the rights of corporations. Like, for instance, all of Lancashire doesn't want fracking to happen here. All of it. The only people who do want fracking to happen here is fucking Quadrilla. Right? The war is between people and corporations. This is going to be the same at a national level. So the whole notion right, left, done. You heard it here first, folks. Also, capitalism's died, but that's another day entirely. So, um, you've heard this lie before. Yes? We're all in this together. Okay? He's right. What he, what he didn't tell you was, who's we? When he's talking about we, who's he talking about? Banks, corporations, toy party, sports, stuff. <laughs> so, I, I'm not a Tory party fan, clearly. Um, my, only fact, qu my only question is, if the other idiot had got in, would he have been up there? If what? If the other idiot had got in, would he have been up there? Um, I well, didn't have an idiots, weren't they? So I, didn't have a, I don't have a problem. All the same, aren't they? They are all the same. They are, the politicians. Personally, politically speaking, I'm an anarchist. Right? I don't believe in representative government. I believe in other things. Did you ever vote for Monster Raven in the party? No. Probably stood for them. No, no they really tweeted one of my tweets <laughs> last week. No, I'm an anarchist, not an idiot. Okay? I believe in educating people using technology to facilitate politics going forward, or facilitate their own society going forward. Yeah? That's what I believe in. I don't believe in a political class. His dad, millionaire. Right? He is the fifth Queen's fifth cousin. Is yes, how is that, demo how is that demonstrably, how is that dem uh, democracy at all? It isn't. He went to Eton like every fucker else in the cabinet, apart from the women, that's good. But how is that a, demo how is that a democracy? <laughs> it's a good idea for Eton, obviously. How, that how is it a democracy? It's not. Anyway, so credible equals the opposite of evasive. You all know where I stand. <laughs> say what you're going to say, you mean it. Exactly. We're going to come on to customer care in a little bit. But, credibility is the opposite of evasive. Now, when you think about when you're writing your copy, are you evasive, even slightly, or are you direct? Do you hope that things will happen? Or will you make them happen? What can you guarantee? Where are you willing to draw the line and stand behind it? But if you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, Chances are the customer will walk out the door. Not, not at all. Some customers will. Um, just to say this with Ria, let know. It's um, last night, again, yeah. um, I was sat in front of a, um, a cust potential customer, an outsider, and a, 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 a client, um, or just offering some of our support services. And they were all in an hour and about paying, only small customer, they were going to pay um, £80 something a month for, for our support. Uh, it was only an hour and about eighty pounds, and I'd, I'd heard it somewhere before, and I'd, I'd, I was sick of listening to him at that point, to be honest. <laughs> but, um, and he, he he mentioned something about Sky TV, and I'd heard it before, and I went, "So you're willing? You're probably paying more for your Sky TV than for us to support your business. Which which matters to you more, your business or Sky TV?" Um, I said, "Because if if you pay more for Sky, and you, that's worth more than." Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I'm trying to help you, isn't it? <laughs> you say that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, start student again. Good work. They're, they're, they're now a client. <laughs> exactly. Um, what was his reaction? What was his reaction? Um, he basically said fair point and signed the 
Because what you did is you made, it, you made it absolutely relevant. You proved your credibility by going, look, fuck your money, take a walk, understand that this is an investment in your business. You turned it from um, discretionary spending into strategic spending. Yeah, that's what you did because you flipped it there. Because the way I see it now is, if he doesn't want to spend that eighty pound with us, and wants to go spend thirty pounds with somewhere else, and he's not, he's not the person I want to work with because he's not gonna. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't just get it. So. Good work. <laughs> Fantastic. So, but again, you could have been evasive about that. You could have been, well, but it was just direct, absolute whole truth. It's this or this. Yeah. If you really, if you're spending X amount of money on. Come in. <laughs> Three hours from Warrington. Oh, bless you. That's so impressive. Yeah. 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 How much love you? How much love you to still be here? Bless you, darling. <laughs> so you couldn't turn around once you were on the other side. No, but they're not sensitive. You're not going to turn around yet, are you? No, oh, love. <laughs> this is why I do this. Phil's smashing it business wise. People tell me they love me. Fucking get in. So, um, Trust formula. Again, uh, what time is it now? Watch, watch. Six to six. Five to six. Right, we'll do five minutes and then have a quick break. Um, risk. To quote Joe again, uh, risk, is, risk is the rust in trust. Right? The thing is, is that the more... Appreciate that. So, the, the more people... Per, the more risk you perceive in anything, the less likely you are to trust them. For instance, at the beginning when I said, would you trust me for three minutes? Rather than, would you just give me the blanket trust? There is much less risk in three minutes than there is ever. Yeah? So, one of the things people misunderstand about risk, oh yeah, Captain Obvious. So, <coughs> I had to bring Captain Obvious back. He's going to appear in every single fucking presentation I ever do again now. Um, Where did you find him? Uh, Google. Captain, <laughs> Captain, okay. Captain Obvious says people don't like risk. They fucking don't, you know. They really don't like risk at all. Um, because risk is it's a threefold thing. Right? Not only is it intellectual, but it's also emotional and personal. We don't respond to risk like a risk assessment. You know? If if I feel my children are at risk of being hurt, stabbed, burned, or something, it, it's it's not a rational response I have. You know, it's not like, oh, that would be terrible. That would be, I'd better look into that. <laughs> yeah. What I do is I get, it gets emotional and then it gets personal. How, you know, fucking, how dare you? How, how dare you put my children at risk? My children at risk. So when you think about what your offers are to your business, what your offers are to your clients, what risk is inherent? Yeah, because the intellectual is, yes, I understand it. The emotional is the, the response that comes from that. And then the personal bit is, that's about me, it's about damage to, to me and, and, and my thing. And the better you can mitigate this risk with story or guarantee or social proof, the more likely you are to make sales. Because the less risk, the more trust. I don't really understand that. No, I disagree completely. I mean, but the gambler thrives on risk. And every entrepreneur flies on risk. Mm -hmm. The difference is you balance the risk against the reward. Yeah. Right? But you don't simply say, oh no, I don't like risk, and I walk away from it. I didn't say that. You, don't show, your, you don't show your client that you're, there, you're a risk. That's what you I didn't say to. that. What you do is you, it's about the offer, isn't it? It's about that 90, 20, 90, oh, you want to the first week. Okay, the offer is. Um, but every transaction contains risk and reward. Of course it does. Of course it does. wants to know there's no risk in them. Hiring a venue, another venue not being available. Or being yeah, well, you, well, you don't go, you can, you can have this venue, might be tidy, might not be. Yeah. Yeah. What, what you do is you, guarantee, you put guarantees in place so that it's all yeah, reward. People do. You can have this venue, it's called the Tower of London, it's wonderful, but it's £100,000 an hour. Yes. Or you can is have it? this village hall and it's £5 yes, an hour. Yes, but there are certain, might not do all you want. certain terms and conditions within that. I wouldn't want, event, I wouldn't want the. Um, Tower London at 20 quid if it was full of sewage. No. You know what I mean? So there's certain things you expect, there's certain th risks it's inherent in that. It's full of rocks, actually. However, yeah. so the thing is, is that I'm not saying, I'm not saying 
you can get rid of responses, you can mitigate it. Right? So the offer, 90% what? Yeah? The 10% how? And this is and this is the mistake that people make. Okay, is that the what, when when I go into gambling, I'm not thinking about playing cards or what I'm thinking about is the millions I'm gonna win. Yeah? So that's that's what I'm thinking about. Okay? So the risks, I would say professional gamblers are risk experts. Right? They don't ignore the risk. They don't even balance one against the other. If you're any good at cards, you understand um, you understand statistics enormously well. That's different between a professional gambler and an addicted gambler. Uh, well, an addicted gambler doesn't it has no place in this conversation because they're on the Okay, that, that's that's like saying, well, heroin addicts, blah 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 blah. They have a they have a distorted reasoning because of their addiction. Same with gal same with gamblers, but professional gamblers understand this enormously well at every level. How many sevens are in the pack? How many? This is why when you play cards in a casino, you have a four or seven deck shoe. You don't work with a single pack of cards because people can count cards amazingly well. So what they do is. They stack it into a four deck shoe. You don't know what cards come out next. Yeah? Sorry, Julie. I got all the stuff about, or oh, I think I got all the stuff about the risk, but I'm not quite sure where those three words all fit in. I'm not quite. Well, risk, risk manifests itself in three different facets. Yeah. Okay. When people do a risk assessment, yeah. it's this. Okay. Yeah? yeah. So what, people don't fa what people don't factor into their risk assessments are generally people getting flighty or emotional mm -hmm. during, during, or after, or. You know, kind of let's say something goes wrong, or let's say you know, I have a very high threshold for risk personally. My missus, not so much. I'm quite happy to throw my children around um, on in quite dangerous places. <laughs> it's a bad thing, <laughs> you know. And because I, I have a much I have a more muted response to the risk, emotionally speaking, than my wife does. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, and what we person risk is. It's always personal. Yeah? People who understand risk understand that it's always personal. When you're thinking about business risk, business risk is also personal. Yeah. Or, get fired or, get or I'm going to have to lay off 5,000 people. Yeah. Yeah? So what most people, the reason why I mention this is that most people just think that risk is intellectual. Right? That they can do a risk assessment with a nice set of boxes and they can put X's in them and they think, that's it, it's fucking done, that's risk sorted. But you have to consider the risk. For instance, when you're talking to your people about hiring a venue, you will be able to remove all kinds of risks. Right? We're insured that if there's a force majeure and the clergyman, leave, excuse me, the clergyman leaves the keys at his mum's, that you know, you're insured so that we'll cover the co any costs you've had on suppliers and that kind of thing. We're covered against blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you can do that. You can also have these are the terms and conditions. This is what we guarantee for every single, um, every single venue that we do. Mitigate risk. Mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. Because and as well as the intellectual thing, you have to think about their feelings. Let's say things go wrong. How are they going to feel about that? What can you do about that? From a personal point of view, how can you make that all of this a little more personal so that's a personal touch? Because people don't buy from businesses; they buy from people. Cool. Um, about six o'clock now. I think. Okay. Well, uh, have I finished? Ah, right. So, what risk is there in what you are offering? There's always a risk. Um, if you think about your products and services, what it's like to work with, your brand experience, all that kind of stuff, what risk is in there? So I looked at me. Um, my the risk, the risk in what I offer, generally quite sweary. Pretty anti Tory. Uh, you may have picked that up. You tell your client that beforehand that you swear. Huh? You tell your clients beforehand that you swear. Yeah, swearing. man. People, people see me talk. For those people who've seen me talk at events, first thing I say is I'm pretty sweary. I'm sorry about that. If you don't like it, fuck off. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah? Because you're here because you get me. You know what I mean? You're here because you get it. Um, Maybe the exception of Julian, I think he's still making my dog. Good. I think the politics stuff's a waste of time, but the rest of it's fine. <laughs> it's a grand delivery thing. <laughs> it's a good thing that you're a posh, Geordie. 
I'm not posh. My dad's a shipbuilder. I was whatever, just well educated. Whatever you posh. So, um, <laughs> what I bring risks swearing. Change is a risk in itself. Coaches among you, you have to mitigate that. Okay? Because people go, oh yes, I want all of the thing, I want the nice thing. But they don't think about the journey in between and how it's uncomfortable. If you improve as a person at anything, you have to, there's changes. If you become more successful and become richer, you have to, there's a kind of, who am I going to take with me? How are my friends still going to know? How am I going to be able to trust them? How much gold diggeriness is there going to be going on? How can, can I believe it's going to sell my story? These are all change and risk. And the more you can help people mitigate the, the impact of change, one of, the, one of my favourite people in the world is a woman called Lisa Sasevich. She kind of thinks about it in terms of PSPS. Okay? When she thinks, when she's doing any kind of event promise, she thinks problem solution, problem solution. Okay? So, um, she uses a thing called speak to sell. It's <coughs> already good. Um, she, so, speak to sell is like, okay, first problem. How do I speak and create a selling engine from my speaking? Yeah. How can I create a speech that creates sales at the end of it? That's kind of how I do it with networking. Okay. Problem <laughs> solution. Yeah. So this is how you create a better. This is how you create a better speech. Okay. The next pro The next impact of that is great. I've got a speech. What the hell do I do now? So what she does, she does a booking thing. How do I get booked? Here's a solution to this. So what she does, right at the beginning of this. She makes the offer, problem, solution, problem, solution. So that goes, not only will we not only will show you how to, to speak better and to turn that into a profitable business engine, I'll show you how to get booked as well. Fucking was all where do I sign? It's good, very American, but good. So, um, how can you guys make an event promise? For instance, your badges. Get our badge. What, and there's some kind of benefit in that, but there may be. How do you remember? How do you remember to bring it with you every week? How do you remember? You know, there's problems that come up with that. Okay, I've got this lovely badge. How do I, how do I transport it? How do I keep it? How do I? What if I lose the back of the magnet? What, what, and these are all problems that you solve, and then it makes it a more compelling thing. You get it? Yeah. Okay, great. So. Um, yes, that's the end of the, kind of, uh, the risk bit, but if you can think about the risks inherent in what you do, how can you mitigate those things? Because the better you can mitigate them, the more likely people are to buy from you. Um, this is the subconscious buyer narrative that I'm going to be talking about next week. It falls quite a lot to pocket. So, um, have a little break, 10 minutes, and then another 5 minutes, bathroom break, effectively. And then uh, come back in five. Thank you. <coughs> so, little comment on for now. Um, the next bit is distance. We kind of touched on this roughly before. Now, This is one of the kind of things that remove trust from you, reduce the amount of trust, risk, and distance. Um, by distance, I'm not talking about geographical, like you know, proximity. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. What I'm talking about is the distance between what we say and what we do, what we say and what we mean, your interests and my interests, and your backgrounds, interests and values, and mine. Yeah. So we're back to talking about commonalities. We're talking, and we're talking about brand acuity, what we say and what we do and what we say and what we mean. Because authenticity is absolutely paramount. If you think about, I'm going to use you as an example here. Yeah, so. um, Sarah recently has reached an epiphany about her pink hair. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. Ta da! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and for ages, your clients, from what you said. for ages have been hiding it in the little bun, think about professionality and all that kind of stuff. For me personally, I think that having pink hair adds something to the brand, and it shows a little bit of rock and roll and punky attitude that I think reflects Sarah's design better than bland vanilla professionality. So, um, 
your brand will be stronger for taking that little bit of a risk because it's, it's closer to what you're saying, you know, what you're saying, what you do with the same kind of thing. I'm kind of punky, my designs are amazing, blah, 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 blah. Here's, I'm living my brand. And living your brand and walking and talk is the key to credibility and the shorter distance, the more trust, yeah? The shorter distance between what you say and what you do, the more believable you are. The shorter distance between what you say and what you mean, the more trust you can engender. The closer we are as people. I suffer a lot from <laughs> from this. From what? <laughs> so, just, when you went, you'd like to go back to what we say and what we mean. Yeah. I think I understand the words, but what was that actually mean in practice? Okay. If I, you've met me a lot now. If I, if I said to you, um, <clears throat> I'm quite quiet to work with, and um, everything's really smooth sailing all the time, um, there would be absolutely no points of challenge between us working. Let's sign, let's sign a contract, let's go. There'd be a massive gap between what, what was said and what was the truth. That would be more the first one. What we say yes, what we and what we say and what we mean, mm, okay, fine. What we say and what we mean, what we say, like... Um, David Cameron's a good choice. Funny you should mention that. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Fucking lie. Fucking lie. Exactly. What were you talking about before about David Cameron? What you're saying was, um, I don't want to cut services. I don't want to remove uh, working tax credits. That's what you were saying. But what so he why means is he doing is, it? What he means is, I'm not making any promises. How do, I, I get all. I think I get all that. Yeah. How does that translate into the brand for my, uh, or how I'm trying to position my and sell my products and services? I couldn't speak to that because I don't know how you're trying to do that. If you want to give me, for instance, then we could give that a shot. No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn on that one myself. I'm trying to look at what can I do differently or where do I do that wrong? Not say I do it right. Um, I, get, I get that your interest, my interest. So just, I mean, obviously, if, you, if you're clearly spotted as meaning something totally different from what you say, people aren't going to trust you. I well, get that bit. Yeah, I'm not sure what that, but if I'm, if I'm working with a prospective, prospective client, I'm trying to think, what are the sort of screw-ups am I going to make with, on that one? Not listening. Okay. I think, sorry, sorry. I can think of an example, you know, you say to somebody, there's the fee, well, these are the sessions, the rest of it, you know, you pay this, I'll give you ongoing support, there'll be email and telephone support when you need it. When, yeah. at, when it turns out, what you do is, he sends you an email because he's got a problem with, you know, relationships with his team or whatever, yeah. and you get back to him 36 hours later because you don't check your emails that often. So the, the support's there, but your concept is different about what you're providing from what he was expecting or what she was expecting. Okay. Good example. So, yeah, and I, yes, I, I kind of, what I was saying about where do I fall over is that the fact that I'm an outlier, right, where normality and regular people are like a dot on the horizon for me, I, I'm not the usual kind of person, and sometimes people can feel alienated by that because it takes a special kind of person to, to, to kind of get with where I'm going, that's you guys, by the way. <laughs> no, seriously, if, if you weren't kind of intellectually flexible and emotionally robust, you wouldn't be here because you would be shocked or you would think, I don't give a fucker, you might not be wrong on that account, but, yeah. Yeah. but you know what I mean, it's like, you kind of get it, you get a sense of humour, you get, you get it, I, I'm, I'm not a vanilla product, in short, so I do suffer from that, because my, people who get me are small but perfectly formed. And um, this is your background interests and, and, and values and mine is a really interesting one. In fact that um, back to the, the, the Geordie Nation, the Geordie, the International Geordie Network, if I'm much more likely to trust somebody with a Geordie accent than with that one. It's just the way it is, because it's my back my background. And my values are born in the northeast on a working class land, whatever Bilal might say. You know, regardless of regardless of my schooling, I'm still a working class boy. 
You know, I've never crossed a picket line in my life. I've always when you drink friends. tea, you drink like this, mate. I'm no, no. Sure. I've got my hand around a mug. <laughs> And you know where exactly where well drinking out the teapot, I'm rock on. You know exactly where so, the cutlery goes as well. So and this is the this is the question of who is your tribe and how do they know that you belong to them? What signifiers can you show? Yeah. My uncle Steve used to used to hitchhike loads and all he would do would put a new castle when he was hitchhiking, he'd just put a new castle scarf on. Every single George driver would just stop and pick him up. <laughs> exactly. So he was just showing I'm from here and they were going, so we get on board. So um, and that's down to all of this is down to your brand, I would say. Because what you say and what you do, brand in question. What you say and what you mean, brand in question. Your interest, my interest, brand in question. Values, brand in question. Um, so, thinking about all of these, is this man trustworthy? Is what he says what he meant? I think if you like his message, he probably is. And, and the proof of that is that somehow he's prime minister um do you know how many people actually voted for him yeah, 11 million yeah, that's still quite a lot so for those 11 million ah, okay the thing is do you know how many ukip got <coughs> five seven no, five and a half million they got one seat no i know I mean, <laughs> i'm not suggesting but what i'm saying is that by that argument the, the system's more at fault than, than anything else. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 So, however, this man, by any means necessary, fucking liar. This is going to be a theme of today. He, he does not tell the truth. Whether or not those lies work, different story entirely. Okay? Um, yeah, the next bit of the trust formula is about care. Now, I know, how sweet, lovely. Uh, so I did a little bit of, I've done quite a lot of digging on, on care this week because I think business and care is a really interesting, interesting subject. Now, so I, first of all, I've got a working kind of, a working kind of, uh, definition. thank you, working kind of definition. Basically is um, pr looking after people's health, welfare and well-being, yeah, Give, giving, you know, looking after them, basically, thinking of their needs, coping for that. And then I, I did a kind of a little bit, quite a lot of research actually, on customer care. Now, firstly, when you put customer care into Google, the first three or four pages that come up are about customer service. So, customer instantly they're seeing the changes completely and totally transferable, which I don't agree with. But when you look at when I, so I kind of looked at what there was in customer service and service skills. This is what Kung Fu. It sounded a lot like fucking Kung Fu. Seriously, there's things about like dealing with customers, how to cope with any kind of customer and any kind of, like dealing with, coping with, handle surprises. Did you notice what the group I did you was called? The group I did you on Facebook? Yes. That's the reason. Indeed. But there's, there's this notion in the fact that all of this is reactive. Right? And then, then it started talking about acting. Like you have to pretend. Like you give a shit about your customers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like acting. Right? And then this is That's how customer service has gone down the pan in this country. This is interesting. There's never been any customer service in this country. Um, then Really? Never been any customer care. Never. Are we known for a serious question, right? Mm -hmm. When I lived abroad, I lived in Germany for five years and I was pissed off with some of the customer service that I got when I came back and it was nice to get a certain, certain level of politeness. Just confirm that I lived in Germany for about 20 years, different league, absolutely <laughs> right. Absolutely right. Exactly, and you know, their idea of customer service and ours is just like, I used to, the amount of times I complain, I used to get so many free things. Well, I got shot, I got my cat was in the supermarket in Preston, and Sainz was in Preston. I got you friendly, bloody yeah. <laughs> yeah. Literally. I got that, it's always like, we've oh my god, it's so we've nice to meet somebody smiling happy. She's come back to stay with us yeah. on her holiday, she was with us last year, and we met her at the airport, and she came out, she said, it, they were so nice. She's talking about immigration. <laughs> Who thinks immigration is nice? <laughs> well, the Germans. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was in the shop in the traffic centre on, uh, on Sunday. It was packed. Hmm. You couldn't move. There was no space. No. Guess which shop it was? No idea. It was the Apple shop. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. With their geniuses. Yeah. And it, I don't know whether that fits in with customer care, but oh my god. I mean, it, it just, it was like yeah. everyone in the traffic centre was, was in the Apple shop. 
Maybe okay. for many different was it, reasons. What, what, but what I was the there. customer service like though? It was brilliant. Mm, good. Yeah. They're very good in there because the thing is, if you're not good, they fire you straight away. American company. Mm. American company. It's like that. What's the, what's the, the sorry tangent? But that what's that uh, car rental company that's with the American and the British guy? Oh, but, yeah. Right. yeah. They're generally quite good actually. Oh, they were the once or twice, and they're really good. Yeah, enterprise, quite good. I like them. But it was abroad though when I got. And then this is the, then it kind of was, and this is the these were all taken from kind of like um, HR specialists and customer service specialists top tips, yeah. right? These are taken directly out of the way they deal with it. And this is, this is kind of interesting. Knowing when too much time has been spent. Okay. How does, does this sound like care? It's very like us and them, isn't it? Exactly. Like those, oh, those bloody penny bones. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't they just give us the money and fuck off? Yeah. Yeah. So when you look at this, provision of what is necessary for the health, welfare, and maintenance, and protection of somebody or something, how does this match up with what care is? Keep that there. <laughs> Please. OED. Oxford English Dictionary. Yeah, well, this is us putting it well, in our notes. I don't think it's that all those comments come from the perspective <coughs> of the needs of the company. Mm. And what we're talking about here is the needs of the customer. Exactly. A lot of people forget that, and that's Which when is exactly the, my point. The, cost, the companies have got the best. What do you reckon? Okay, I know you don't, you're not a massive fan of Richard Branson, are you? Not a huge fan, no. But what do you think of their customer service? It depends. It depends. True Virgin companies are <coughs> quite good. Mm. Um, Virgin Rail, excellent. If you tweet about them, they tend to upgrade you. A little bit of a secret there. Um, well, complain about it because I have to tweet. No, if you, if you tweet about if you tweet about uh, Andy Jackson, for those of you who know, are yeah, Andy, yeah, yeah, he he is he's the king of getting Virgin upgrades, and he does that via Twitter all the time. They use a thing called Lithium, a program called Lithium to to track tweets. Uh, we did it. <laughs> we did it. Um, my wife and I did an experiment. She was on the phone trying. We were having like a some issue with the television or something. And she was on the phone, and I'd left it 15 minutes, and she was still like holding. And I said, "I'll, I'll fix it in a minute." I sent a single tweet. They got back to me within two minutes, literally straight away, because of this lithium thing. They've got an eye on it all the time. So interesting. I did, I did it with the Hay Group. Yeah. They weren't paying an invoice, and it went weeks and weeks and then months. And eventually, I tweeted and I said, "Big company, lots of emails. Now won't even answer, answer yeah. the phone. I got a check two days later. <laughs> no letter, no compliments, like, just a check. Will you please shut the fuck up?" Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and th this is the notion of care. Um, my favourite ones of the lot, and these, right? This sounds like sales. This is service skills, right? These are the things that, this is, I'm not going to mention the people, but they are, they are globally regarded in the training of, um, the training of uh, front-facing service staff. And this is, what, <laughs> this is what this is. They know how to close. Sounds like sales. Okay? They save and retain delight. What the fuck is retaining delight? <laughs> you get a special bag or something? It's like, oh, I've got my We're so sorry delight. about your shit, sir, <laughs> shit experience with us, but you know what? We'll be happy to X, Y, and Z. Exactly. But, but how do you retain delight? You can't. It's nonsense. Make use of strategic automation and carefully data driven. <laughs> Does this sound like company care to you? Does this, would you feel cared for when someone says, worry not, madam, I can carefully, care, I'm carefully data driven. <laughs> well, I feel safer already, thank you very much. Okay, fantastic. Um, who does it sound like they're caring for? Thanks. Exactly. Exactly. So, the simple thing in customer care is just give a fuck. It's that simple. And you can tell. You can tell. Because the thing is, if you don't do this, then nothing you put on, it's a bit like um, taking a diamond, wrapping it in horse shit, and then varnishing the horse shit. Right? It, because it does it, it, it's still shit on the inside, you know? And unless, you, unless you care, it doesn't matter what you dress it up in, Varnish, nail varnish, all that kind of stuff. It's still crap in the middle. You, you just give a fuck. And if you give it, it doesn't matter what you do because you'll be able to tell that pe people will be able to tell that you care because you'll just go, come and have a seat, come talk to me. If you, 
I don't care how long it takes, we'll sort this out. And the whole idea of knowing when you spend too much time, irrelevant, you know when you spend enough time, when they're happy. And I guarantee, when they're happy, they'll tell their friends. It's ten times easier to get business from a happy customer you've already got than get a new one. Exactly. Talk about the uh, Christmas. Christmas. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Just give a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> customer, so customer care according to me. Just give a fuck. Um, repeat customers, on average, spend 33% more than new customers as well. And they're cheaper to find. Um, the thing is about care is... Don't say you care, do it. It's like, um, I'm, I'm sure all of your relationships are fantastic, but I'm not sure, I would much rather have somebody show me they loved me rather than tell me that they loved me. And it's all very well, people going, oh, I love you, I love you, but if they're running around cheating on me, it doesn't matter what they say, it's what they do that matters. And this is, this is the brand, say it like you mean it, me what we say kind of thing is that just show me, just spend some time. And that generally what, what care is, is spending time effectively. It's kind of actions speak louder than words, isn't it? Absolutely. So consider consider how you show your people you care. How do you care? For you guys, be a key part of your value offer to start with is that, is that notion of caring is that you're not just going via Google and booking, what you're doing is you can get involved in your service system. That would be really interesting, is that the more you can show your service system, the better. Same with you guys, your coaches, all three of you, it is the more you can show people you care and that you actually give a fuck, the more people, so what you're saying is, how am I getting my marketing wrong? Find, find a way of showing intimacy, because what you guys do is intimate in an extreme degree. Yeah, yeah, like it a lot, like it a lot. Yeah. Not trying but, to do it yet, but I like it a lot. <laughs> talk as long as you want about it. <laughs> um, but the, the, it's about intimacy. It's about in the way you, in the way you write, your copy needs to be intimate. Your copy needs to be real. It needs to be written like a person, not like a you know robot. Because anyone can write like a robot. If you if you are part, if if you if you are one of them use their language. You know, if you were a bunch of 17 year olds now, I'd be like, yo man, you know, I'd look like a 12 but I give a But you know what I mean? You've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to speak the right language for the right people in you. Yeah? And if you don't, then, then they won't listen. You can't take it for granted. I mean, we, I sat indoors last night having a drink with my wife, and I heard her say, I love you. I can't imagine my life without you. And I thought, and I said, is that you talking or the Bacardi? She said, that's me talking to the Bacardi. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, and this is the thing you said about. It's an old, you know, very old joke. Um, and the thing is, if you care, they'll come back. Okay. Now, the thing is, it's, it's an autotelic experience. Right. Um, according to Midlarsky and Kahana in a, in a massive study that they did in 1993, was that if you choose to care, if you choose to care, you get benefit out of the act itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you if you're doing it if, you, if you're doing it of your own accord, if you're choosing to care for your customers, then you will enjoy the act of doing it. It doesn't matter on the response. You know, because I care about what Phil does. I'm really loving it when he comes in and went, woo, 53 more sales. So that's 54. <laughs> 54, wasn't it? How, 50 ever, however. Well, 50 something. 50 lots. Yeah, 50 <laughs> lots. But, <clears throat> you know, exactly. And that, that's Bring fantastic. Bring you, mate, remember that. <laughs> that's fantastic, because I care about what happens to you. And it makes us happier as people, if we, if we actually deliberately care. So, um, and repeat customers spend 33% more than new customers. So, um, last bit of the trust formula is consistency. And consistency is key, right? The thing is, like most things in life, um, doing something once is never enough. Sadly. Um, and consistency can be the secret to um, this. 
this isn't about lifting all the heaviest weights in the world one time, right? Whether or not you like it or not, you have to appreciate the amazing phenomenality of, of just how difficult that is. It's also the secret to, to yoga. I don't know if anybody does yoga, but the difficult, difficult poses are done over time, and it's the consistency of approach. Doing it five minutes every day, better than doing it three hours, cold the crow. Uh, when I'm fit, I can do this. Anyway. So, um, There's a lot you could do when you're... Well, it is, yeah. Um, and also, secret to innovation is consistency. Right? Constantly asking yourself interesting questions. So, none of these, none of these things are done by doing things once. Yeah? Jobs innovated consistently for 30 years, built two multi-billion dollar companies. He was a horrible man by all means, mm -hmm. by, by all reports. He wasn't a very nice person at all. He used to drive his teams into the ground. But he was consistently like that. When you worked with him, that's what you got. Um, so I've also heard that consistency is the key to the female orgasm. But we'll go into that on a day. I'm not even joking. Um, <laughs> it is. It's about expectation, apparently. Um, so, the thing about consistency is, is that we are what we repeatedly do. So, what is it you guys repeatedly do? And this is the thing about brand, is that you can say one thing, I'm very relaxed and, you know, I'm easy, approachable and lovely and very quiet. I'm not. I'm repeatedly the opposite of that. There's two states. There's two states to, to existence. Uh, at a cellular level. Okay, it's two states at a cellular level anabolism and catabolism. Okay, cellular level, you're either growing or shrinking. There is no status, there's no stasis. Okay? There is no, there is no still. Your body is in one or two states. Okay? It is the same with everything. Your business is either growing or shrinking. Because whatever you do, the world exists around you. Yeah? There is no stasis. Because if you turn over a thousand pounds this year, if you turn over a thousand pounds next year, have you got the same size business? No, because of inflation and blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. You've actually got about a 5% smaller business. Yeah? A thousand again, another amount reduced. Yeah? So, what are you doing to grow your business? This is the thing, it's consistency. How do you manage your time? If you've got five days, if you've got five working days a week, let's assume for a laugh we all work nine to five, five, to five days a week, right? How much of that time do you put into building your business every week? How much of that do you put in your time? How much time do you put in your week of building your brand every week? Of removing things that you don't want to do every week? Because it's by consistent action that we make things happen, and it's the same for trust. If I, if I came, <laughs> some of you haven't met me that often, but if, if I came in one day and I was like, oh, whatever, and just, just kind of talk, and was just kind of quiet, you'd think something was up, wouldn't you? Because that's not who I am, right? Um, and it's that concept, and then you start thinking, well, hang on, if he's not like that now, does that mean he's really like that, or is he, is he just pretending all the times he is up? Seeds of doubt, re reducing of trust. So consistency is the key to building trust, because every time, if you want somebody in there like that, every time, you're gonna depend on that. Yeah, so consistency, key to trust. Um, in that example, you were there was a vulnerability that comes about. Is that does and does that not make you think they're more human? I want just more. I will touch on that a little oh. bit. Thank you very much. This is where Bernie Brown comes in. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So um, we are what we repeatedly do. 
Yes, I think that's quite... But we trust him. I, I can trust him to lie. He's consistent. He is, he's very consistent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he, is, he is consistent. Um, he consistently wheels up death to the same child for his own game, which makes him horrible. So, we are, what do you repeat and do versus what do you promise? If you consistently you promise innovation and then you're using off the peg stuff, can you be trusted? No. If you consistently promise um, love and attention, but regularly deliver you being in the pub and your significant other being in the house, what have you been consistent in? What do you repeatedly do? More importantly, is this what your customers want? If you think about what you do do consistently, is it what your customers want? How do you know? Ask them. Ask them. Listen. What do they want? What help do they need? Yeah? Very important. Because um, if, you, if you build in small stuff consistently, so Einstein said, um, Compound interest is one of the most powerful forces in the universe. Yeah? You know compound interest? Mm -hmm. You all aware what compound interest is? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's about consistency. Yeah? That's just simple, consistent addition. And it's inc incredibly powerful. Um, so, the tr that's the trust formula. The more connected and credible you are, um, divided by how much risk and how much distance there is between you and your. You want to Okay. How much um, how much risk that you present and how much distance there is between how believable you are multiplied by how much you visibly care and show that consistently equals trust. So if you if you were going to be really clever about this, you could give yourself a little score sheet every week and think, okay, how have I built a connection with my audience this week? How have I built my credibility? How have I reduced the risk? How have I, how have I shown the distance between what I say and what I believe is the same thing? How have I shown people that I've cared? How have I shown, how have I been consistent this week? And you can give yourself a scorecard and mark it every week. There's an excellent book by a guy called Marshall Goldsmith who, um, called Mojo about how, how you improve your performance consistently. And what he says is that the key is asking yourself the right questions every day. He's got an agreement with his mate where they have a 10 minute conversation where they each ask each other some pre-agreed questions. And either, the only admissible answers are yes, no, or a number. So, did you do press ups today? Yes, how many? 500. Did you do this today? No. Did you do this today? Yes. Did you? So you can track it all the time. <laughs> yeah, he's got 20 and what he does is he marks it every day. Um, so that consistent approach. So you could do the same. You could do the same with if you wanted to build trust. You could just mark yourself on how many times you did such. Yeah, and this is what coaches do: is you hold yourself accountable and measure and in increase. Yeah. So trust. This is about the principles of trust, um, and then how those principles turn into practices. Um, <laughs> so, these are kind of overruling kind of ways I approach trust. So, people are not stupid, believe it or not. I know there's a lot of things about people are very thick, people, they're not, people are not stupid, they just don't like conflict. Okay? So, if you piss the people, if you piss your customers off, they're not going to complain, they're just not going to come, they're just going to fuck off. Yeah? Because rather than kind of, if you've, if you've had, you have a special kind of people who are complainers generally. Yeah. And I, I just there's a there's a chip shop up in a Preston that I will never go back to. What's it called? Mm -hmm. uh, it's the Queen Victoria one. Where's that? Behind the university. I don't know that area. And I popped in once. The woman was an arse. Never going back there again. Just because and I'm not gonna complain, there's no point. She's on minimum wage, she doesn't have to care. And it doesn't matter what they say to her, if she's in the same mood again, she's going to do the same kind of thing. So, fuck it. Never go back. There are all the chip shops. Didn't complain. Just went, okay, never go back. Same thing in, that's why I don't go to Boots. Don't go to Boots. Because 
A, the tax avoiding bastards, and B, their customer service is dreadful. The people that have worked in the shop, awful. Um, Except for when I work there. Of course, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> obviously. That's why it went down there. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. It was indeed, it was indeed after that. So, but yeah, if you piss your customers off, don't expect them to get on the, on the blower. They'll just quietly disappear. You know? Um, there's people who were here in the first week. Not here. Not what they wanted. Good. Fantastic. Okay. Um, but if you do an old customer, mm -hmm. and you didn't mean to, but it wasn't intentional, let's say something outside of your control happens, if you often go to that customer and say, I acknowledge this happened, mm -hmm. and we are sorry for that, these yep. are the things that we can change differently, you often find that... They become more fans. Yeah, yes. exactly. The thing is, is that don't rely on them complaining. Yeah, that, this is my point. Is that you know they're not stupid. You know, don't don't treat them like they're stupid. That that people just avoid conflict. They just go away because it's often more bother to complain. The more people likely to complain to if you ask them directly. Yes, if it depends on the conversation. I think more people more people are, the people like to complain. It's like your business development model. Of having an event where people want to come and whinge. Yeah. Brilliant. Because give people a shot for whinging, honestly, you'll be booting them out of the door at the end of it, going, stop talking now, you've had enough. But if you're just expecting people to manage your customer service for you, never going to happen. So you have to build that conversation in. Back to listening again. Yeah. Um, another principle is share everything. Um, this is another one of my anti corporate stances. Being professional is bullshit, okay? But unless that's what your natural brand is, is being quite grown up, quite this, quite that. Share everything. Share, 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 your, your, share your wins and your losses. Share, involve people in your story. There's a reason for this. Um, these are my children. Um, How old are they? Uh, she's this a little while old now. She's six and he's 12. Um, your boy looks like you. <laughs> and this is, and the reason why is vicariousness. Saffron is, um, she's doing amazing things now because she's seven and she can do like handstands and she can spell and she can read and she, she's, she's doing new things. And when I see her do that, I feel better. When I see her do that, I feel better. Like, when Phil comes in with his 50, sale, 50 plus sales story, I feel better. Because we live vicariously through people we know and care about. Yeah? So help people do that. Share your wins. Get them on side. Okay? Now, is it, is it, <laughs> is it just children? No. Fucking Bruce Willis, right? When you, when you watch your, when you watch your, um, your big kadoosh, your Hollywood blockbusters, you go on an emotional roller coaster with them. You get excited when they get excited because of, because of vicariousness. They, they're in peril, our heart rate goes up. They get laid, our heart rate goes up. <laughs> you know? It's, yeah. Does it pay off? Simply by observing something, we feel better. So if you share your stories, they feel what you feel. And back to being part of a tribe, if if you're showing them that you trust them enough with kind of this is my story, this is this is what I actually think, this is how I'm kind of going about this, then they feel part of the, the gig with you, don't they? So but pretending that you're pretending that you're always right, pretending that you know that you're you're perfect in every way. Politicians do this a lot. You know, oh, I've never, I've, I've never smoked any drugs, I've never done anything, I've never done... The thing is, George Osborne, right? There's this whole kind of thing about him taking coke with hookers and blah, 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 in Germany, somewhere, I think. If he came out and went, yep, totally did, it was amazing, I've moved on now, though. I trust him much more than, no, I couldn't bother, I definitely wasn't cocaine on the table, it might have been some sugar. <laughs> <laughs> We're not fucking stupid, George. Or, in fact, Gideon, as his real name is. Is that his real name? Yeah. Gideon George, G Gideon, Gideon Osborne. Osborne. Um, his real name is Gideon though, but he doesn't use Gideon because it makes him sound too posh. 
So that bit of that one with Jack Straw and Nick, was it Nick, or not, what is, when they, the two of them got stunk for selling their speeches, selling their time. Yeah. They was the Nick is Ridley, who was the Conservative mm. that got done? Oh, and remember. then was Jack Straw. Yeah. The Conservative did exactly that. Yeah. And Jack Straw just said up and said, guys, I've been really naive, I made a big mistake. Yeah, exactly. And you never heard it again? I mean, no, exactly. They, he handled it perfectly. He just went, yeah. yep, fucked up, sorry. <laughs> um, End of story. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yes, vicariousness. We, um, we, what we see, we feel, and we like to feel part of everything. So, if you're trying to create a tribe, don't just show them the shiny stuff. Show them the stuff where you fail. They will pick you up. They will. I promise. Um, and then you can turn your audience into your own cheering section. Because the people you work with want you to do well. They do. Um, vulnerability. Be flawed. Brene Brown in a moment. The difference between emeralds and rubies is just the quality of the flooring. These are significantly more flawed, I believe, than these. And these are significantly more valuable. Emeralds are much more valuable than rubies. Um, take these idiots. Right? <laughs> Boris Johnson should be Prime Minister. It'd be hilarious. Boris? No, it wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't put him in charge of a paper shop, never mind the country. It'd be hilarious. Can you imagine? Yeah. Thank you for proving my point. They're effectively the same person. Are they? Yeah. Does that actually get on? No, they hate each other. I know they exactly. That's they the see point. each other as friends, but they're basically the same person. Are they? Both went to Eton. Both went to Oxford. Both went. They, they were in the Bullingdon Club together. They're effectively the same person, right? However, Boris is significantly more likable yeah. than. David Cameron, why is this? Because he's, fun. he's funny, he's an idiot. Because he's flawed. Right? You know he's bought three water cannons? Yeah, and you can't use them. Not only can he not use them, what kind of mayor buys water cannons to use on his own public? Exactly. Yeah. He's a dangerous man, but purely no because offense. people think he's a buffoon. No, wouldn't it be funny if Boris was in charge? Fucking no! He's dangerous! I won't vote for him. He's dangerous. But more likable because of his flawedness. Did you see him on um, Jonathan? Was it Jonathan Ross or was he on Probably chat, chat show? He's like, I'm, I'm, there's certain questions. I'm not actually allowed to answer many questions because my team won't let me. Yes. Because of what comes out of his mouth and he knows it. Yeah. But that's part of the act. It is part of the act. He, he plays the buffoon. He's, he's highly he intelligent. Did, watch he's the, the thing is, <clears throat> I'm not trying to beat on politicians particularly, but they're just really, because he's they a are arbiters of. You know, they are kind of people we have to trust. When you watch the Andrew Marr interview, and Andrew Marr pushes him on how he lied as a journalist, and how he gets really angry. Yeah. Like, really, how very fucking dare you. No, no more of that, blah, 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 I'm just a buffoon, blah, blah, blah. He gets like, how fucking dare you? Like, really angry about it. Because most of the things he does is completely stage managed. Yeah. The whole everything. Yeah, mind, yeah, yeah. mind you, you can, to be honest, reverse a lot of this. I mean, look at Blair. Yeah. He was, he's a dangerous social war criminal. Path. Yeah, war absolutely. Criminal. And I'm only picking, I, I just don't know, yeah, no, I'm no, no bigger no. fan of Blair than I am of, yeah. really, I, I would imprison Blair personally for his, for his act yeah, in there, he's appalling. taking us to invade a country that didn't need it. But my point is, if you're flared, if you're flawed, <laughs> Damn it! Damn it! If a combination of style and being uh, having failures. Yeah. So that's yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> this, you know, for the night. And I, I base my my style on being flawed. You know, I could stand here in a suit and try and convince you all of my gravitas and standing. However, it's not me. I show you my flaws. I show, I'm very clear and open about how flawed I am and what kind of person I am. Hopefully it, engen it hopefully engenders more trust. Because you can, I believe, you know at least I believe what I say. So, um, we can see ourselves in the flaws as well as Brene Brown. Brene Brown, her TED talk is amazing. And she does quite a lot of work on um, vulnerability. And 
one of the key things she suggests is that we I can't how to word it. Sorry, I've not really prepared this very well. But behold my flaws. The the thing is about vulnerability is that we trust people who are wholehearted. And what she what her research is all about the notion of, of being wholehearted, that people get more out of life when they're willing to take take the hits and fail. Yeah? And then when they show you that failure, we can trust that. There's a speaking there's a speaking term called the dip. You'll start to notice this now. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I told you about it. Yeah. Okay. You start to notice this now is that when speakers kind of talk, what they'll do is they'll go, Hi, I'm brilliant. Okay? I'm absolutely magnificent and this is what I talk about. So they they talk about how great they are here. And then they go, but it hasn't always been like this. Okay? For a while, I was just like you. And then, I tell you, it was so bad. And then they give you a very detailed, a detailed description, a personal account, a shining moment of detail when they're at the bottom. I tell you, I was at the bottom, I was at the bones of my arse. I was, you know, kind of alone, sitting in the bed seat. I would, didn't do And then I made a decision to change. I made a decision to change. I put in. I enacted all of the strategies I'm about to tell you, and now I'm here. Okay, that's what good speakers do. Bad speakers just go, "I'm brilliant, and here's what you need to do." Yeah, now, you need to take the people on a journey. You've got to show them a story. There's a reason why. The reason why the dip works is because you go, "I'm brilliant." Okay, and most people are here, right? Middling. Yeah, there's a kind of parabola about you know where most people are kind of here. Yeah. So what you do is you have to go beneath that to pick them up and take them with you. Yeah? And that's it. It's called the dip. Most speakers use this. The good ones definitely do. Because that way you can go, I'm brilliant, but I was also used to be like you. And here's how you can be as brilliant as me. Everyone's in with you in the room and off you go. Yeah? And that's about vulnerability. Yeah? The notion of vulnerability is showing people how you haven't always got it right. How you, and this is what kind of Johnson plays on a lot. I'm, I'm a buffoon, I get it wrong all the time. Ha, 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 aren't I just like you? No, he's not. He's in charge of London, for God's sake. Exactly. And he's not, he's not completely bothered it up, to be honest. He loves politics. <laughs> um, otherwise, I'll just go off for a massive dive. It's a bit frustrating politics is such, a, such a different world that it's kind of. No. But the reason, the reason why I use part and reason politicians is because they're right at the other extreme where they break all of the rules. You have no alternative, though. Yeah, that's part of the world that they're in. That's what they do, isn't it? No, yes and no. Yeah. Uh, there's a reason why the 99% exists. The, all, of the, all of the pressure groups are starting to happen is because people are tired of letting them away with that. And the whole old politics is beginning to change. Oh, don't doubt that for a second. Exactly. So, and this is, this is why my point is, is that polit politicians are, the good ones understand how to engender trust. People like uh, Tony Benn, fantastic at engendering trust because he's entirely 100% himself. Yeah? Boris Johnson plays at himself. Just for the record, I see Tony Benn as actually quite a fraud, personally. How? Oh, no, we're getting off the limits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'd like to talk to you about that at some point. Yeah. Um, no, he turned down the lordship. Yeah, I think he's showing off. He's doing off what you just keep. I'm doing. I'm being a hypocrite now because I was complaining about it. He's doing the same there as he, as David Cameron did with his handicapped child. But I'll take it well. Possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. So, but the thing is, is that we see ourselves on the floor of floors of others, yeah. right? Is that if I say I've made some this mistake and that mistake and the other mistake, you go, oh, I've done that too. And that's what we've seen before about I'm part of that tribe. So what you're doing is giving people the option to connect through your own failure. If you go, I've never made any mistakes ever, people are like, no, balls. Because everybody makes mistakes and everybody has flaws. The last bit, and this is kind of where I want to kind of finish it today, and this is <laughs> what? We're finishing at the start. <laughs> yes. The reason for that. A, it's kind of my style. But there's, there's kind of one thing people need from you before they will trust you. 
okay? One thing, that they need to feel before they will even engage in the trust game. And that your customer needs to feel that they are significant to you. Does anybody here like feeling like a number? No. Does anybody here like feeling like a, a kind of code word or any, you know, a wallet or as long as it's number one. <laughs> it's like when I get emails from people trying to get me to do freelance work. If I just get dear sir or dear, I just I delete it straight yeah, away. Because it's not to you. If it's dear Bill, then I get they get a response. And any any mail client will do that for you pretty much. Mm. You know, you can automate that. Mm. Can do appropriate automation, hopefully. Because we care. <laughs> at the end of the day, at least they put the effort and time into it. You may know it's automated, but at least they put time and effort into exactly. it. But significance, significance is, the, is the start of it to, to be seen as a person. Then you can, if, I'm, if we're having a personal relationship, then I can start to trust you. If I'm just one of your audience, there's a reason so, why. So when I got a letter from my bank, my business bank, yeah. dear madam, I was right to move, wasn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I once got an envelope. Well, exactly. Is this first I'm not in touch with that yet, but yeah, I'm getting yeah. there. You're coming out or something. Yes, that's all right. um, so, I, I had an address, I had a uh, letter addressed to Nigel Soupsol once. It's like, yeah, who's that? It's supposed to be to me, but yeah, not in gloves. But yeah. I get that as well when, the tr when you get somebody trying to flog you some PPI and you go, is that. And if they say my name wrong, will they say even slightly incorrect? I'm sorry, wrong number. Exactly. So they have to know that they're significant to you, and the more significant they feel, the more likely they are to trust you, the more intimate your relationship. I'm not suggesting you sleep with clients, but the more intimate your relationship, the more they know about you personally, the more you know about them personally, the more likely they are to trust you. This is where social media kicks in. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, you, if I refer you back to... You've really on LinkedIn now. If I refer you, back to diagram from week one, this is your social, and that all of this leads to this bit. Mm -hmm. Trust is here. So your social activity drives towards the, drives knowledge into trust. Uh, is, is that, are there any questions? Is that clear? How was that for you, darling? Does, does it make sense? Yeah. Did, and for those of you who haven't spoken to you about the, the mythical fifth session, um, the mythical fifth session is obviously no by trust by each one of the sessions is this, and there's a mythical fifth session the week after that. And what that is going to be is an open session where we pull the bones out of it and turn it into a series of practical steps for those of you who are interested. So I was talking to Steve a little bit about this before that this all seems to be about more about why and there needs to be more work done to do the what do I do. So that's fifth week to be about the what. Um, Depends on your business. Indeed, it depends on your business, but yeah, that's that's kind of I'm depending on you guys to come with a whole list of questions at that point. So thank you very much for, for coming. For those people who spent three hours on the mobile, thank you very much. Next week, next week we're going to be doing the fourth stage, which is uh, the buy section, which is about making a compelling offer, um, selling by knowing what your customers are thinking. Um, how to stack value upon value to create action, um, and what do you willing to say no? The core to this is um, the buyer's internal narrative I was describing before, about understanding what story, what story people need to tell themselves to be okay with the purchase. And we all do that for everything, therefore. Whether or not you have a boss, whether it's you buying it, or you're trying to convince yourself that the cat's going to like it, you know. So, um, that's next week. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if there's anyone who wants to chat afterwards, if there's any questions, then just uh, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.